Hello. This has been an amazing day. I hope you all have been having a good time. I'm going to have some little fun. Uh, I work at this place. National Geographic. Wait, that's, that's not right. Uh, <laughs> on so many levels. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, let's see. There we go. That's much better. Um, National Geographic Magazine. It's where I work. I'm one of four design editors on staff. And every Monday morning, I get together with our team of cartographers and artists. <laughs> And uh, we go over our projects and deadlines for the week. Now, th the meeting is as mundane as any other meeting, uh, except on the Mondays when one of us brings in something to share. And a few weeks ago, a coworker shared this. It's the collage work of an American artist named George Sakal. And George, he covers his large canvases with tiny, tiny shreds and scraps of National Geographic magazine. If, if you look up in this corner here, I believe that is one of our maps of southern Utah torn to shreds. Uh, <laughs> now, I don't mind. I find his work completely fascinating. But one of our coworkers disagreed. Her reaction, someone's got too much time on their hands. Now, what does that even mean to say that someone has too much time on their hands? It's pejorative. It implies that this someone is frittering their life away when they could otherwise be contributing meaningfully to the world. Now, I ask, what should George Sakal have been doing instead? I mean, if you're going to look at life through that perspective, I can think of a few other people who had too much time on their hands. Michelangelo spent three years chipping away at a piece of rock. I mean, a huge waste of time. <laughs> Cezanne. Painted the same scene over 60 times. And for what? He only figured out the plasticity of visual space, compressing three dimensions into two, thereby ushering in over a century of modern painting. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and these guys, not just Buzz and Neil, but all the men and women on the ground who made this historic moment possible. Think of how long that took. As we learned earlier today, this is the worst possible All test slide, slide you can make. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> what do I do with my time? Well, I make stuff, stuff like this. This is a map uh, that shows translations of many of our nation's Native American place names. I spent about nine months working with a linguist and a researcher on this. For example, Malibu, California translates to, it makes a loud noise all the time over there. <laughs> and my personal favorite, the Adirondacks in New York, tree eaters. Bet you didn't know that. Um, Bobby Braun earlier today was talking about going to Mars and what that might entail. Well, we have a section of the magazine called The Big Idea, and I and my team started thinking, well, how do you terraform Mars? How do you make Mars into a climate-controlled planet like Earth. And so, you know, this is real pie-in-the-sky stuff. There are researchers looking into it. But the big idea isn't to tell you what we think, but just to start a discussion. And in six easy steps over a thousand years, we walk you through making an atmosphere, vegetation, and, uh, well, this guy's in, like, an L.L. Bean catalog over here on the <laughs> 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 I just, just made, made it up. up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, um... About a year before the disaster in the Gulf that happened this year, we did a story on oil spill prevention technologies um, that have happened since Exxon Valdez. And at the time, I thought that readers would be largely unfamiliar with what that substance looks like. So I decided to make my own spill of sorts. Uh, I got some crude, brought it into the photo studio, and made some oil paintings. Now for me, success, is when I can show you something you've seen in a way you've never seen it before. And that was the one we ended up using on the page with a little map of all the spills since Exxon Valdez. Now, pharmaceuticals starting to end up in fish, 
tissue all around the country in our watersheds and their livers and fillets. And I thought, well, clearly, we need to make a fish out of pills. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. I mean, uh, not just any pills, not sugar pills or 3D rendered pills, but the actual medications and the actual proportions in which they were found in the studies. So to pull this off, we set up shop in a pharmacy uh, after hours, and we had about two hours to pull it off. And that's what the final spread looks like. Now, <laughs> a lot of the projects that we undertake uh, have a very high risk of, um, of being terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but when they work out, it's pretty cool. And here's another example of one that worked out. Uh, to mark the 60th anniversary of the passing of the UN's Decla Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I decided to make the 1600 word document visual. And uh, it was pretty flattering. Within a few weeks of this being published, the UN called up and asked if they could install it in their guided tour of the General Assembly in New York. So, you know, I hope this translates, right? I, every one of these pieces has a, something in common. Each one was revised and revised and revised and then revised again. So I hope when you open up the magazine and you look at a piece of mine or one of my coworkers, or if you happen to go to New York and you see this, I hope you understand that all this time was put into it. And I wouldn't mind at all if your first reaction was, someone's got too much time on their hands. Because <laughs> in that moment, you were acknowledging that what you were seeing did not come out of a can. Someone took the time to make something with their hands. Now, this summer I had a wonderful, wonderful opportunity, as Sam was mentioning, to make something completely different with my hands, a museum. And not just any museum, a museum of unnatural history. Now, the museum doubles as a storefront for the organization and cre nonprofit creative writing tutor tutoring center that Sam was mentioning. The organization in D.C. is called A26DC. It's part of a larger network of tutoring centers around the country dedicated to teaching kids how to write. And so the museum sparks their imaginations, and then they write poems and stories, and we publish them, and it's fantastic, right? And with the help of my good friend Min Lei and a designer, Oliver Monday, and the fantastic support of the A26 staff and financial donors, we were able to turn a space that looks like this into this. Mural cave, taught myself how to weld, or, you know, whatever, and then uh, crazy skeletons and creatures. We turned a space that looks like this into this. This is the tutoring center on the back where kids ages 6 to 18 can come in for after school homework help, get their stories and all published. It's really special. And that crazy skeleton you saw up front, well, that was one of my first ideas when I started on the project. So as I do with everything, I started with a sketch, big Sharpie marker, some paper, ordered some bones, and then assembled the whole thing in my living room. <laughs> There's the sketch in the corner. <laughs> Very accurate. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll tell you, it was just probably the hardest thing about articulating a mythical skeleton in your living room would have to be articulating a mythical skeleton in your living room. <laughs> Either that or the creepiness factor which made dating difficult, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll give you one more bonus tip. If you happen to find yourself articulating a mythical skeleton and you go to the hardware store looking for a 12-inch drill bit, when the clerk asks you what you're drilling through, <laughs> do not say bone. <laughs> <laughs> this is very <laughs> awkward. Yeah, so this, the museum has been open for about two weeks, and uh, there's been a steady stream of kids coming in for tutoring, and adults come in to buy many of our products, like what you just saw, Unicorn Tears. Uh, puts the sparkle in suffering. I think we... <laughs> I think we changed that to puts the sparkle in sadness, because, you know, it's for the kids, and suffering was a little like, whoa, you know. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we got other things like unnaturalist brand field journals for when you have to go right now. <laughs> 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 
And our, our full line of formaldehyde, semi-formaldehyde, informaldehyde, and business casualdehyde. <laughs> Depending on your lab's dress code, I suppose. Now the kids, the kids, they love our interactive fossil dig. And they get to dig around and get all these bones. Now they can't buy the bones that they unearthed, but they can barter for them by singing a song or telling a joke. And I can't tell you the smile it puts on your face when you see a little girl marching down the street holding a femur that she has earned. <laughs> Folks, this is what matters. It's not about making a magazine or making a museum. It's about making experiences, using our time and our training to connect one human being to another. And we live in an age that values speed and efficiency. And as a result, we expect one another to be immediate geniuses. That's not the way it works. You can't download brilliance on demand. We are not satellite TV. We're human beings, and for us to make anything that lasts, that resonates, that rises above the expected, well, we need to have time to think, to tinker, to be wrong over and over and over again until we're finally right. Now, I know such time doesn't really look good on a ledger sheet, but if we're going to tell ourselves that we have to be right on the first try, we're not going to innovate. And chances are, we won't even get started. So what can we do? Well, I'd say one thing, pretty easy, is just to regain a respect for the creative process. And I think all of us, every one of us, if you've never had a lick of art training in the world, can understand that a sculpture had to be sculpted and that it probably took a long time. Or that a painting had to be painted one brushstroke at a time, and that took a while. But in most of the other spheres in which we operate, from design to literature to science, we've come to expect results with the press of a button, the design button, the novel button, the mission to Mars button. Where's Bobby? Does he know, didn't know where that is? <laughs> All right. And so the other day I was at the supermarket and I saw this. Homemade cookies in 20 minutes. <laughs> That's the cookie button. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I don't have much interest in pressing the cookie button. For me, I much prefer my mother's butter cookies. Now, funny thing is, <laughs> you know, look at how invested she is in the process, H reading this handwritten recipe, sifting the flour, taking a taste. Now, <laughs> she has no idea that I'm showing you these pictures. <laughs> and I think she might even be watching the live stream right now. So, Mom, I'm sorry, but, you know, this is just one way that I think of her. You know, someone who did not have much time in our hand, who does not, like the one, this was a few Christmases ago, did not much have much time, but still took the time with me to make these cookies, to bake them, to hand decorate every one of them, so that on Christmas morning, my nieces and nephew could come in and bite into and taste the warm, buttery goodness of a tree or a camel or a wreath with little sprinkles and a silver ball on top. And you know why they taste so good, right? She adds that one extra special ingredient, which is love. Yeah, love, care, attention, whatever you want to call it. That's what we add when we do our best work. Here's another guy, devoted his life to investing love in his projects, devoted his life and his time to making an experience for other people. And Tony Gaudi, 128 years ago, set to work on one of the most ambitious projects ever made with human hands. La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Every square inch of this thing is covered in sculptural ornamentation. I don't know if you've been there. It's staggering. What's more incredible is the interior. To support all this concrete and all the sculptural ornamentation, he had to devise a whole new type of interior structural column, and he learned how to do that by looking at a tree. Even more incredible, this thing's supposed to have 18 towers. Only eight have been built yet. 
This thing's been under construction for 128 years, and it's still not done. The Pope is coming on Sunday to celebrate the first Mass there in 128 years, and it's still not done. They've got the roof, but they don't have the towers. One of the front facades is missing. We just don't make things on that kind of sort of scale anymore. And every inch of it has the mark of Gaudi's hand. Now, I was there in March, absolutely spellbound, came back to Geographic and insisted, begged, pleaded, and I actually didn't even need that much persuasion because when I told our editors that I'd like to do a story on Gaudi and this church, they were like, yeah, nature, religion, architecture, art, the world, sure, done. My coworker, Fernando Baptista, one of our graphic editors, grew up in Spain, has been longing to draw this church his entire life. So that's what we did. This is a four-page gatefold that's in the upcoming December issue of the magazine. And it's all hand-drawn by my friend Fernando Baptista. What you're seeing here is something that does not exist yet. All those gray areas, all the gray areas are the towers that haven't been built. The facade in the front that has not been built. But Fernando worked with the architects in Spain, working from Gaudi's original models, to produce this for you. Now, I believe something magical happened here when you just saw this. I heard a little bit of gasp in the room. And I believe that when Fernando was drawing this, perhaps unbeknownst to him, little bits of his soul came up through his body, passed through his archives of experience, down through his arm, activating muscle memory through his fingers, onto his pencil and into the paper. And when you gazed upon this work, all that soul that he invested leapt off the screen, entered through your eyes, all the little rods and cones through your archives of experience and came to rest inside your soul. This sharing of souls is the bond between a creator and the viewer. When you look at a piece like this, in a sense, you are tasting your mother's butter cookies. You don't get that same experience with store-bought cookies. And you do not get that same experience when we, in whatever field that we hail from, press the buttons. So we must smash these buttons. Yeah, the purpose of a button is to replicate results. It's to be predictable. But art is not predictable. And the human spirit is not predictable. So we must smash these buttons. We must experiment. We must take the time to work with our hands. Because that's the heart of art. And that is the heart of innovation. Thank you for your time.